Welcome, everyone, or uh, for those joining us for the first time, uh, and welcome back for those who've joined us now the second time. So this is this, our second episode in six webinars that we're doing uh, here at the Ayn Rand Institute on Ayn Rand's political philosophy. We're, we're studying the basic principles and trying to get an understanding of the essence of her political philosophy. And I'm joined again uh, this evening well, I'm on the East Coast of the United States, so it's evening for me, at least. Uh, I'm joined on the eve this evening with uh, Greg Salmieri and uh, Agostina, who is at ARI uh, and serving for as the TA, Greg's co-instructor with me uh, in this webinar. And today we're going to be talking about the nature and purpose of government. The last uh, webinar a couple of days ago, we talked about what, according to Ayn Rand, is the basic principle of political philosophy, which is the principle of individual rights. And Greg will start us off just a, a little bit of summary of what we covered and makes a couple additional comments coming out of some of the Facebook discussion that happened after uh, last Tuesday's webinar. So last time we were talking about the essay, Man's Rights, uh, and that essay is often paired with this one, The Nature of Government. And we talked about Rand's view that rights are a moral principle. They're a moral principle defining and sanctioning an individual's freedom of action in a social context. We explored what that means. And uh, her view that uh, rights uh, are the means of subordinating society to moral law, and then the basic rights that we have, life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, there were two issues that came up, well, uh, are a few issues actually that came up in the follow-up chat on Facebook after that episode, which we'll address at different points tonight because they'll come up again in connection with uh, the essay we're reading for tonight. But uh, one that I just wanted to follow up on um, before we get into that, which is this phrase that uh, the, the principle of individual rights is the means by which government is subordinated to uh, moral law, or society rather, is subordinated to moral law. And the idea that on other views that uh, held sway prior to the principle of individual rights and that are resurgent now as that principle is being forgotten, that society is not subject to moral law and is in effect amoral. And one question that came up last time and that's been pondered a bit on the discussion board since is, whether when Rand talks about society being subordinated to moral law and the other views not having society subordinated to moral law, having it above the law, whether we're to understand this concept of moral law to mean specifically the uh, true moral law, the proper account of morality, in Rand's view, her account of morality, or whether to understand it more, uh, more generally, the idea being uh, that... Um, society is in effect amoral or you know, not subject to any moral law on the other views. And last time we were talking part of the time as though um, what she's saying is that moral law here refers to her own understanding of morality. I think at least some of these uses early on in man's rights are a little bit broader than that. There's the idea she refers to previous societies, that is ones before the formulation of the principle of individual rights, as having been amoral. And I take it that the idea is um, morality says, uh, that is conventional, altruist morality, says that uh, the society is good, that there ought to be a society, but it doesn't provide any standard by which the society can, or the government or the people acting on behalf of the society as a whole, could judge their actions and determine how to act. And so in effect, society is above morality. It's not governed by, it's not um, subject to and not judgeable by a moral code, whereas individuals within it are, and the moral code they're judgeable by uh, is the false moral code that says they should be sacrificing to it. So in that sense, I think we are working, as some of the people online suggested, with a broader conception of morality that's ranging over not just Rand's moral code, but any conception of there being a code of values to guide um, guide a life and to guide action. But Ankar, you had some things you wanted to say about this too, I think. I uh, Yeah, just one uh, comment that I'll make that I think in thinking about Rand's view, you should 
remember, or I mean, you can remember it if you've read some of her other things, such as in The Fountainhead, this issue comes up, that she thinks of the, the worship of society when you have that, I mean, altruism is otherism, it's, it's the whole focus is on others. And, and that is an aspect of a collectivist outlook where the group is the crucial thing, some kind of collective and the individual is morally subordinate and subservient to that. That she thinks of modern collectivism, I mean, in this, the essay in The Nature of Government, Soviet, Russia, Nazi, Germany are a couple examples. And she thinks of these as examples of modern uh, collectivism put into political practice. She often makes the point that they treat society the way God used to be treated. It's a secularization of that viewpoint. And I think the, the there's debates about this in, in religious circles. The right way to think of God is he brings good and evil into existence, but he's not subject, subject to those laws or principle. He stands above, he's the source. And, so, and it's now a similar view that society tells the individual how they have to act, but society is above the moral law. And that's the sense in which you can't apply the norms to society itself. And that's what she's objecting to, um, that a proper view it has the, the, rejects that completely. Yeah, I think that's right. Now, if we had a view whereby there were some norms you could apply to society itself, but they weren't um, based on the rights of the individuals, then those would you know, be some attempt to apply moral law to society, but not the right moral law. And so I think when we have the phrase, uh, the concept of individual rights subordinate society to moral law, here we're going beyond just the idea of some moral law, uh, in fact, societies typically haven't been subordinated to any moral law. Now they are, and they're subordinated to the right moral law, in essence, with the um, the America's founders and uh, somewhat prior to that in, in, in Britain, but primarily with the founding of America. And we should say a word or, or remind people then of what these rights are. Um, the, the rights are the rights to life, to liberty, to property, and to the pursuit of happiness. And Ankar, you wanted to say a word or two about just uh, elaborating more on what those rights mean? Yeah, so last time we were talking about that Rand's focus is on the conditions of existence that are required for the individual to be able to live and, 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 and thrive, and the conditions that then have to be preserved and secured, protected in social organization. And she did not think of it at all as an accident that the fundamental rights that were being defined during the Enlightenment period leading up to the founding of America were in various forms, but now as we would put them, life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Because this isn't the life, she says, is the one fundamental right. And the other three are broad specifications, I think, of the kind of action that an individual human being has to engage in in order to live. And it's he has to be able to think for himself, and that is centrally what liberty is about. Think and act, um, and the action in particular is that he has to create, we were talking last time about he has to create new wealth and then secure it. And that's what the right to property is. And it all is towards a goal of advancing his own well-being, his happiness. So you have to single out that he can make that his paramount goal in life and that he has to be secure in his ability to do that. So there's a logic to why it's these rights are the fundamental rights and the cashing out of the right to life. Good, so let's just say a bit about um, the format for today. We're going to talk a bit about the structure of the essay and just kind of overview that for everyone. And then we're going to talk about uh, some of the main topics that come up in the essay. Uh, uh, and we want to be taking questions from you guys throughout. So you can type some things in the chat. If you have a, a question in particular, the best ways to do it are either to write it in the questions module, and then we'll get a list of questions and we'll, uh, we'll know that we can, uh, can take them up and answer them and we can kind of queue them up. 
or uh, we'd like to have some audio questions uh, by people talking. And if you have an audio question, you can put your hand up uh, under your, uh, in the participants uh, blog. You should be able to see your own name and put your hand up. And if you do that, um, we'll be able to see that you have a hand raised. I think Augustina will be able to initiate a chat with you and, and get some sense review of what your question is about. And so we'll know before we call on you what we're going to be talking to you about. Um, but if that doesn't work, we might just try calling on some of you and seeing what happens. So that's the, uh, the way to proceed. And um, Ankar, you want to start us off on just summarizing the structure of the essay? Uh, sure, yeah. So the, the, this essay, The Nature of Government, um, th this is a quick encapsulation of its structure, I think. So you get an introduction, which is the definition of government and the question we're focused on and why you need such an institution. <clears throat> then the first major point is that there's certain benefits, major, major benefits that you can derive from social organization if you have the right kind of social organization. And then it's the question of how do you get that social organization? And Rand's arguing that you need the government. You need a government, indeed a proper government, to secure the benefits that are possible through social organization, you need, it, it, and it has to be a certain kind of government subordinate to the principle of individual rights and which has certain functions. So she discusses briefly the functions of a proper government. And that's the essence, I think, of the positive case. Then there's a critique of, um, uh, of particularly anarchism and it br being brought up by supposedly free market advocates um, and why she rejects that as it's not at all the right way to think about this issue. And the wrap up is to think about uh, a little bit about the history of the concept of government and the forms of government that have existed, that there had always been some kind of grasp that the government is, has a, a function to preserve law and order, has a moral function, but it was never really understood and explicitly defined until the time of the founders. And you got, I mean, we talked about this a little bit last time, a different relationship of citizen to government, indeed of viewing it as a citizen, not a subject. And so the government now function by permission of and, and delegation of certain powers by the citizenry. The citizens don't function by permission of the government. And sh she's arguing and, and, and thinking, asking us to think about that it's now moving in the other direction, that it's more and more the citizen functions, needs the permission of government to function, and government is, doesn't need permission. It basically can do anything unless maybe it, it's explicitly prohibited to do it. But if it's not, it can basically do anything. And that's very worrisome because it's overturning the, the achievement that is America, I think she thinks. Good, so then the first uh, major section of the essay is where we talk about, the, or where Rand talks about rather, the value of society and the conditions uh, in which uh, society has these values. So, what she calls a social existence. So the value of a social existence and the conditions in which a social existence is of value. And bringing up something we talked about last time, uh, we might want to say a bit just about what a social existence is in the first place, right? So she contrasts it to living alone on a desert island. But I think also equally it would be contrasted to living with one or two people on a desert island, having your immediate family or a little tiny tribe that's got a few people who you know in it, right? A social existence is living in a society with a lot of people, they're strangers, you're interacting on different terms with them. Uh, the, the way, in fact, that almost all human beings do live is in societies. And what are the benefits of this? So this was the first question we asked uh, about this essay on Facebook. And uh, Augustina, do you want to summarize for us uh, what people had to say about it on Facebook in the chat uh, we had over the course of the week? Yes, so essentially um, most participants agreed um, and a comment by Amesh pretty much sums up what everyone brought up 
and he said, humans derive great value by living in a society in which they can benefit from the knowledge discovered by others and from the division of labor and trade that multiplies the productiveness they would be able to achieve in isolation. So a rational, productive, free society that does not set up a conflict between its ethics and the requirements of man's nature is the type of society that would be a value to a human being. Good. So it's the benefits are, are knowledge and trade, right? And notice it's important that what we're talking about is the benefits of a, it, it's not friendship and all of these other things, which are tremendous benefits, of course, of having other people in your life. But those aren't the benefits that are on uh, being mentioned here, because we're talking about specifically a whole society. What's the benefit of a whole society, not of just having particular other people in your life? And, uh, Again, it's, it's trade and knowledge. And the conditions uh, on them are the conditions uh, of, uh, of what? Well, it's the having force, right? And ex excluded from society. And so the next major topic to talk about is really force. But before we move on to that, um, is there anything else we want to say about uh, the value of society or the nature of society? Um, does anyone online have any hands about this? Anyone want to have questions they want to raise about this or things they want to say about it? And on Chris, anything you think? Yeah, I, I'm, go I'm going to say something, but we'll see. Uh, we can see uh, if anyone. Um, in the Facebook group, Amesh again and Daniel identify that a precondition for a civilized society is a banning of the use of physical force from social relationships. Mm hmm. Yeah, so that's what we're going to move on to, uh, to talking about force. And I think it's good that they raised that. Ankar, why don't you um, start to make your next point? And if yeah. anyone else has anything they want to say or ask about under the heading of force, you can uh, do this while Ankar is talking. You could chime in so we'll know before we move on that, to, uh, to acknowledge you. Um, she gives, as, the, as, as, as Greg said, the two crucial values are knowledge and trade. I think the order is important, that it's knowledge and then trade. And the issue of knowledge, when one's thinking about the history of government and the thinking about government, the issue of knowledge is really important. We were talking last in the, in the first session, so on Tuesday, about this view that, that if you have a view that wealth is static, that there's the same amount around all the time, it's much easier to think that an individual human life conflicts with the lives of other people and we're all trying to grab a piece of pie and it's a fixed pie and it's if someone gets it, you don't and you're, it's, so it, it's, it's a competition at the level that other animals often experience, but that for man, he can grow and grow in an unlimited way and the root of that from Ayn Rand's perspective, is that he can keep expanding his knowledge. And the more that's grasped about that that's the nature of human beings, I think there's more thought about how do you secure and protect this condition. And if you think of the history of the West, two of the most innovative periods in terms of the development of government towards a better form of government or in ancient Greece, and then in the Enlightenment period. And what is distinctive, one crucial aspect of what's distinctive about those two periods is an explosion in the growth of knowledge. I mean, the, the first is in ancient Greece um, leading up to the Golden Age. And it's astonishing when you look over the period of 150 or 200 years, where it starts and where it ends up. And the more recognition of, like, this is what human beings are capable of. It's what kind of social organization is going to secure and protect this. And there's real um, thinking about that. And then the Enlightenment, which is coming out of the scientific revolution, and, and which is, I mean, they're partly concurrent and partly the scientific revolution is a little earlier, I think. And it's, again, what they grasp is, oh, my God, knowledge can expand at such an incredible and undreamt of way that before that. And it's, again, how do you secure and protect this? Um, so th this is a really important value to understand in thinking about the nature of government, I think, from Rand's perspective. 
Yeah, so both of these are periods where knowledge is tremendously expanding and also um, these are periods where people are aware that it's tremendously expanding. Um, you can see um, in, in, in Greece, uh, there's uh, at the beginning of the Antigone, the play by Sophocles, there's this ode to man, right? Where there's this um, reflection on what a tremendous thing human beings are and that we have all this power. And there's just a lot of reflection on the growth of knowledge in the philosophers of that time. And then uh, Bacon is reflecting on how much more we have to come. And by the time we have the um, the founding of America, there's already been Newton and uh, the whole scientific revolution, which he's the kind of pinnacle. Of. So... Um, we have a, a, a hand up from uh, Megan. Do we want to uh, have, uh, Augustine, have you been able to, uh, has Megan gotten back to you on what she wants to talk about or shall we just, um, okay, so she's asking about something we're going to talk about a little later. So let's, um, uh, let's hold that question until we get to talking about fraud and such, which is something we are going to talk about. But thanks for that question, Megan. All right, so shall we move on to the topic of force? Okay, so one thing I want us to think about is what is force and how is it related to rights? Because uh, Rand has the idea that only, uh, only by force can we violate rights. But just at a more basic level, just what is force? And what, what do we need to understand this concept? So any first thoughts on this from anyone on, online? You just type in the chat or force is a shorthand we're getting from Megan for divorcing a man's rational thinking from his action. Okay, but just literally what is it? So um I mean at one point in a QA, I believe, I don't have the exact reference on me, she was asked Rand was asked what force is, and she said, you know, it's just you can define it ostensibly. It's like that, you know. Uh force. Uh, and I think that's right, but we're all, in effect, if you just think of force as, um, you know, physically um, impinging on somebody or whatever, like the concept of force as it's used in physics, which is just an expansion or a kind of more detailed version of what we can directly perceive, you know, you're in some sense exerting force on people constantly. You know, you're exerting a gravitational force on everything. But also when you talk, you're making, you know, sound waves hit their eardrums. So, so that's not what we mean by force, right? Just that there's some force um, that's emanating from you to them in, the, in the, the merest physics sense of force. So what are we distinguishing force from? Force as opposed to what? Free action, says Megan. Any other thoughts? Felipe says trade. 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 Persuasion. Uh, Alex says persuasion. Mark says voluntary free action. So what I think of this is, is we want to think about what the genus is or what the category uh, is in which we're thinking about force and force as opposed to what. And it's a way to interact with or a way to engage with or deal with others, right? So if there are two people and one's dealing with the other, they can be dealing with them by force or, and then the answers are persuasion, trade. I think the fundamental one is persuasion or consent. So if someone's acting on you, if someone's forcing you, they're acting on you, they're dealing with you without your consent. Uh, they're dealing with you as you deal with a mere object. They're exerting themselves on you regardless of your reason, as Diego is saying, regardless of your thinking, as opposed to them acting like a thinking mind, recognizing that you're a thinker and trying to deal with you rationally, trying to deal with use their reason to deal with your reason. And so persuasion, reasoning with you, Reasoning with you can result in persuading you, can result in persuading you to um, involve, get involved in a trade with them. But um, whatever involvement they have with you will be by your consent, uh, consent reached by a meeting of your minds. And if they try to deal with you or interact with you independent of that, 
They're interacting with you as you would with an object or an animal, and that's, that's acting on you by force. At least that's how I think of the distinction. I always think of force versus consent, force versus persuasion. And you know, consent is what you get by persuasion. So that's how I see the distinction. I always have that contrast in mind when I'm thinking of force. Um, and it seems like you guys are on the same page with that. And I think if you look at Rand's discussions, you always see that contrast being drawn. Force versus reason, why? Well, force versus consent achieved by persuasion, which is uh, a, a function of reason. So Ankar, any, any further thoughts on that of just what, what force is? Um, no, I think that's, that's good. Uh, okay, then the next thing we might want to think about is how does it relate to rights? Because we were talking about rights last time. There's a lot of discussion of rights uh, coming up later in this piece. Uh, we haven't said, we didn't say much about fourth last time, although it is mentioned in the rights piece. Uh, how do force and rights relate? Or is it just like your rights are... Not, do, do your rights just amount to not being forced? Or is there more to say about it? Is force just not violating your rights? How do we connect these two concepts? We're getting a few questions, force and power and extortion. Um, Ankar, do you want to say anything about the connection between force and rights, or do you want me to? Yeah, and I'll say something. Um, she viewed, it's not in this essay, but it's in, in some of her other commentary on politics and what she's contributed to politics. One of the things she singles out is that her argument for the, that the violation of an individual's rights can occur only by the use of physical force. That was an identification that she made, and it's, it's a crucial element of the objectivist view of political philosophy, and she thought it's a new element that to make this fully explicit, that physical force is the only way in which an individual's rights can be violated. And part in thinking of that, then I think you have to think that there's two strands of thinking going on that then she's fully integrating. One strand is that you need to be able to take certain actions in order to live and thrive. And you need to define what these positive actions are. And she insists that rights are the rights to a positive, to a freedom to take certain kinds of actions that you need to be able to take if you're in the pursuit of your life and happiness. And it's not obvious what those actions are. A lot of thinking has to go into that. And then of thinking of how do you formulate this that you can organize society around this knowledge that you're gaining that, well, you need to be able to think, you need to be able to produce, you need to be able to trade. So, and so you get then rights, well, there's a right to freedom of thought, of freedom of speech, of freedom of trade. So that's all on one strand of, of a massive amount of thinking that is going on. And then there's a growing appreciation that when someone initiates force against you, that's bad, it's evil, and it's a special kind of evil that they're bypassing your will, your consent, they're somehow incapacitating your mind and your judgment, and that if thinking of it from the positive, this is so crucial to life. Um, and yet when someone punches you in the face or imprisons you or something, they're taking away this fundamental control of your life. And so it, there's a growing grasp that the it, initiation of force, when someone introduces force into human relationships, that's bad and we have to get rid of this. We have to bar this from society. And you get those two, and then there's the integration of, oh, these integrate into one perspective, one integrator or complete perspective. And that's then what Rand is arguing for. And you can talk about that aspect, Greg, if you, or indeed add to anything that I said. Yes. So you might wonder which of these is sort of first hierarchically, if you have a kind of logical order 
of how these concepts go. Is it force and then rights are defined in terms of force? Um, or is it rights and then force is defined in terms of rights? And, and the answer is neither of those is exactly right. The, the issue of force comes up even when you're thinking about one-on-one -on -one interactions, and that's not yet the context for the concept rights. Um, the concept force is, you know, you can understand why it's wrong to beat someone up and why it's wrong to interact with people that way, independent of having an idea of the concept rights um, and why it would be bad for you to get force. The concept rights comes in when we're thinking about what is it that we need out of a society um, and what is it that, what conditions do we need in a society? What, what is it that we need to live? And then what, what, um, what ranges of actions of ours do we need to be protected within a society? Now, um, part of knowing that is knowing that what can, what they need to be protected from, and that is force. So in that sense, force can be thought of as prior, um, but it's, uh, not fully explicit or doesn't have to be fully explicit when you start understanding that we need this range of action to be protected, that the only thing it needs to be protected from is force. So that's the later integration. And, um, and in any case, we need to understand what range of action needs to be protected to really understand what, uh, and this is we'll talk about as we go forward, uh, what it looks like to um, enact force or be free from force in complex situations. Because what, what it is, well, we'll talk about that as we get to defining rights. Um, Megan, or Ankar, Megan's asking if you could uh, summarize again the two threads regarding rights that you were saying are integrated. I think this is an important point. So would yeah, you so one thread is getting what the positive actions an individual has to perform, and which includes has to perform in a society or be able to perform in a society in order to live. So he needs to be able to think. He needs to be able to produce. He needs to be able to keep the product of what he's created. Um, he needs to be able to trade with it. If he's going to secure the value of trade, that's one of the crucial values of social organization. He needs to be able to trade with others and secure in that ability. So there's a conception of the positive actions that the individual has to be able to take. And then thinking about how do you establish this as a principle of social organization? And so you're getting rights formulated, such as the right to freedom of thought or freedom of speech or freedom of trade. And simultaneous with that is a growing understanding that when force is introduced, this is what the initiation, the person who introduces force into a human relationship, and that's how he's gonna deal with someone else. That's an evil, and it's a special kind of evil because it's negating the very root of the kind of action an individual has to take. He has to be think for himself and use his thoughts then to govern his life his actions, his productivity, his trade with others. And force is by saying, no, I don't need your consent. I don't need your judgment. You're not to engage in reasoning. There's something really, really bad about the introduction of that. And so a proper society has to bar at the door anyone from using, initiating the use of force. And both of those you can see in the Enlightenment period, they're getting a grasp of both of these um, but they're separate. They're not unrelated. But they're, you can distinguish these two strands of thought. Um, um, Ad oh, go ahead, um, Adam has a question that came up on the Facebook group as well. He says, "Aren't there other ways to incapacitate or short circuit your ability to pursue goals besides force?" I see. He has an example here too. Um, so, well, go ahead. Yes. Uh, for example, he says, an evil person paying others to shun you. People seem to be able to be these values to others in all sorts of ways that don't involve force. Yeah, so I, I think it's true that there are all kinds of ways in which people can um, mistreat one another or be unjust to one another that don't involve force. And you, know, you could have an evil person paying people to shun you or just people shunning you for some irrational reason. Maybe they're racist and you're a race they don't like, or um, they just take a dislike to you for some other irrational reason. Um, so this is bad. 
Uh, it's certainly a way in which someone could be unjust. It's certainly a way in which you're worse off than if the people were behaving better towards you and in which you deserve better from them than that. But it's different from force. This leaves you uh, no worse off than if these people didn't exist, right? So if you take all the people who were being unjust to you because they hate you because they are racist, let's say, or because they are um, unjustly accepting the money of some maniacal person who's uh, paying for everyone to shun you. Um, all of these people are acting unjustly towards you. It's bad, it's wrong, um, but, and it leaves you worse off than you would be if they were acting justly. But it doesn't leave you worse off than you would be if they all didn't exist. Right? What they're denying you is a relationship with them. What they're doing is they're absenting themselves from your lives. And that doesn't make you worse than you would be if they didn't exist. That doesn't actively interfere with your life. It merely refrains from uh, doing things that might improve your life. But what someone who's initiating force does is actively interferes in your life. Uh, intrudes in your life, doesn't leave you free or able to go on living your life as though you would if they didn't exist at all. So they become an active obstacle to you rather than simply um, going their own way. Uh, Ankar, any further thoughts on that issue? Uh, yeah, if I, if I, I don't, I guess the question's in the answer section. Now, it, it was something about um, other ways to incapacitate and I think that's an important word. Is there other ways other than force to incapacitate uh, your judgment, mind, and ability to act? And incapacitate means literally you no longer have the capacity to do this. And part of what is being argued when Ayn Rand is singling out force as this is the evil that has to be barred, it's, it's the evil that renders you unable to act on your own judgment. If, uh, I mean, just take the simple kind of example, and this is how we grasp, we start to grasp that force is an evil. Um, a, a kid, a bully at school who beats you up and takes your lunch money, you don't have any capacity to act on your judgment anymore. You think the money's yours, you wanted to buy lunch, you can't do that anymore. You're in, you've lost that capacity. And if um, the other kinds of ego, evils, you still have the capacity to act and to act exactly how you think you should act. Um, and no one is stopping you from doing that. So it's, there's a special sense in which she's saying this is an evil that, that's important, I think, to, to get explicit. Yeah, it's, it's, some people um, exaggerate the point that you can't act under force or you can't think under force to make it seem like as though when force is wielded in your vicinity, you become like a stone or a, or a dog or something and you can't think at all or can't act at all. Um, I think the point is you, you can't act one as you would if the force wasn't there. And two, you can't think in compliance with force. So you can think about if somebody threatens you, your money or your life, you can think about things like, am I able to disarm this gunman? Um, and you can think about whether to comply or not but you can't think about what you should use or any thought you might have about what you'd use the money for if the gunman wasn't there is now moot. And also um, you can't think under his directions or orders. And that's a kind of large point that we'll talk a lot more about when we talk about what is capitalism, the essay next time. Um, but uh, what you're incapacitated from isn't any kind of action at all, but if your arm is broken by someone forcing you, you're now incapacitated and that you can't use your arm. And if they're now threatening to break your arm, unless you hand over some money to them, you are under threat of this kind of incapacitation. And that's different from if they say, well, I won't be your friend anymore, or uh, I won't patronize your store anymore, or whatever it might be. Ankar, Felipe is asking about the difference between force and power. Uh, do you want to say a few words about that in this connection? Um, I mean, they both can be used in a wide sense uh, when, I mean, when you talk in physics about force or about power, they're both a very wide sense of the ability 
to get things done or force is the getting done of that powers more the capacity to get things done in the in, in the more political context you can i mean and this was ayn rand's view two of the crucial distinctions in regard to power or divisions is economic and political power and their political power means the power to use force and to legitimately use force so the legal power to use force and that even when it's used in retaliation it's a destructive power it's aimed at um, the removal of things the stopping of things economic power she thought this is a proper notion that that um, in an in a, an economy people have power and growing power if it's a developing economy you're developing new products new thoughts new uh, inventions, the ability to get work done, to produce things you're going to consume and so on. This is growing. And you can think of this as it's a form of power. It's a power over nature. It's a power to create human values, but it's a positive. And when you're dealing with someone under trade or when it's a it voluntary transaction, it's a trade, it's what they're offering you is a positive. And when you're dealing with the government and its political power, the power being wielded is a negative, and that that's an important distinction in, a, in the political context. Whereas when we're talking about force, it's, the, it's that aspect, it's a negative power of stopping things. There's no positive power. Al has a follow-up question regarding force and incapacitating someone. He asks, can't you be incapacitated by negligence as well as force? If I borrow your camera and carelessly leave it where someone can and does steal it, you no longer have your camera. Yeah, well, this gets us into um, the issues of, uh, of indirect force um, because it's force against property. So let's, um, let's talk about the role of property in force first because uh, if we're talking about your camera, someone can come and smash your camera. And uh, we haven't even talked about that kind of force yet. And then, uh, then we can move on to, to negligent uses of your camera or something like that. So uh, the, the kind of force we've been talking about so far is direct force against your person, murdering you, breaking your arm, beating you up, etc. cetera. Um, but there are several categories of force that go beyond this. And so the first uh, that Rand calls indirect uses of force. And the, the first is force against property, so, so theft or trespass. Um, and uh, Ankar, is there anything you want to say or add about these? Or does anyone have any questions pertaining to theft or, or trespass directly? Uh, Alexandra says, because uh, men live by means of putting physical objects to use, depriving a person of his possessions or interfering with this usage violates his right. I think that's right. And this is where the right to property comes in. Uh, moreover, uh, your property is in effect part of you or part of your life. And so when somebody acts on your property, they're acting sort of indirectly with respect to you. They're acting to separate your productive actions from your ability to consume. And so they're sort of intervening in your life that way. They need to, to intervene in, in your life in that way properly, get your consent, persuade you about it. But they're not doing that if they're exercising force. And so they need consent to deal with your property as well as to deal with you your property being those values that you've created and so have a right to. And, uh, and it's indirect use of force when people uh, uh, steal or trespass on your property. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I would say it's, it's not obvious to me that she's thinking of theft as indirect force. I think there is, there is, there's the issue of force and its paradigm case is someone punches you in the face or constrains you. Then there's force where it's directed at your property and one has to think, and, and in the way that you're saying that one has to have the right conception of property and its relationship to the individual to understand why this is essentially the same thing. And indirect force, particularly when you think of the examples she gives in the essay of unilateral breach of contract, of fraud, of extortion, there's a context in which you could think of these as well, isn't this trade? Isn't this some in, in the consensual? 
And mm -hmm. therefore, why would it be, why is it an issue of a violation of rights? So, and she thinks, no, there is an element of force here. It's more indirect. Um, whereas theft, it's not as, so unilateral breach of contract. It's, I think she thinks sometimes it's the equivalent of theft in that a person could even attend, that like he had no intention to uphold the contract. And in that sense, it's as intentional as a theft but it has the appearance of still being consensual and it's not. And I think that's part of what she's driving at uh, in thinking of indirect uses. Yeah, and this takes us to, to Al's uh, case of the person who negligently destroys your camera. I mean, you've loaned it to him. There was some kind of agreement, uh, whether explicit or implicit in the loan about he'd return it to you in good condition and now he doesn't return it to you in good condition. And it's not that he purposely didn't return it in good condition, but he behaved negligently. Um, now, Al asks, it is, can't you incapacitate someone by negligence as well as by force? And I think, no, uh, the, the result, negligence uh, results in force, either direct or indirect, in those cases in which it violates your right. It's because it results in force. So I can negligently be... Um, well, I would, driving drunk or driving w with negligently having, um, having been negligent in the care of my car such that my brakes are, um, are out because I happen to check them. And, uh, and the result of that is that I crash into you and kill you. And I've, it, it's forced my crashing into you and killed you. But I didn't initiate that force intentionally. I initiated it by negligence. Uh, I did force you. I did, you know, impede in your life physically. I rammed into you, but not because I decided to do it, but because by accident, but where I ought to have done things to prevent that accident. Likewise, you borrow, I borrow my, your property and don't return it. I could not return it intending not to return it because I'm, I'm trying to defraud you or steal from you, or I can negligently not return it because I just forget but still I have your property and I don't have permission to keep having it, or I can break it while I have it either intentionally because I'm malicious or by negligence. And so it's a different uh, axis, negligence versus intent than force versus non-force. And where there is force or for where there's not force, uh, whatever I do, I might do intentionally or through carelessness. And, and this is part of what it means. I mean, this is part of the work of integrating force and what's wrong with it with rights and why in the end they can only be violated by the use of force. You have to think about these kinds of things. Is negligence, is it just another wrong that should be prohibited by the legal system? It's not an aspect of force. And then it would be, well, no, there's other ways to violate rights. If, you th if we think, yeah, negligence has to be prohibited by the law in these kinds of cases, or else of thinking of it as, no, really what it does amount to is an indirect use of force. But that is like, it's not obvious. And that's part of the thinking. And then of getting, okay, yeah, force is evil. And it really is the only way of violating rights if you have a full understanding of the nature of force. Gordon um, raises a good question or a question that's relevant here. Uh, he asks, uh, he raises a situation in which you're trying to help someone avoid getting hit by a car, but at the same time you hit another person and they fall into the path of the car. Do you use force against the second person? So the, the broader category here is we talked about negligent uses of force where um, uh, unintentional uses of force that are due to negligence. What about an unintentional initiation of force that's not due to negligence? Uh, it's just, you know, there's an accident. Maybe while you're trying to do something really good, um, but the, the accident results in, 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 uh, in, well, force. And I think it is force that the accident results in. And uh, in most cases, you are, um, uh, it's part of the government's role to, well, we haven't gotten to government yet, but to step in and rectify that. And when we talk about civil and criminal uh, uh, functions of government in a little bit, I think we'll have occasion to, to comment on that. So the other, um, we've talked about force. We've talked about the threat of force. We've talked about force against property. We've talked a little bit about breach of contract. Ankar, do you want to say a little more about that? Um, yeah, so it's again, 
putting it in the context of, so it, it can seem like it's a voluntary transaction. If it's a real contract, it is, it's a voluntary agreement, but the agreement has certain conditions and that's what both people are consenting to. And if one person either intentionally then defaults on this and says, yeah, I was supposed to pay you for this, the car that I'm, you loaned me and now I'm not paying. Uh, or I'm not returning the card. That can be intentional, as Greg was saying. It can be unintentional that uh, the person just never returns the car. But it amounts to that the transaction from looking at it from the other party is not something he consented to. Um, but in complex contracts, there's often the case where both sides think they're upholding their end of the contract. And they might think the other person's not, or it's, it's just one person is contending, um, you violated the contract, and then he's saying, no, I haven't, I'm upholding my end. And, and that, in complex contracts, it's by no means always obvious. Is this contract being upheld or not? And this is in part that it has to be adjudicated. And it's part of, again, from our view of what a government and its positive function is, it's to, to establish a framework in how these questions are decided that's clear to both parties that how this will be. If there's that kind of dispute, what will happen? Yeah, let me say a little bit about fraud too. A fraud is in a way like intentional breach of contract in extreme cases, but we don't need to bring in contract to think about it because it doesn't need to be a long term. You know, I agree to, um, to buy uh, an item from you and it turns out the item I'm buying is counterfeit or the money I give you is counterfeit. Uh, that's fraud, uh, or it's not what, you know, we're not, it, we, we engage in a transaction, but because of faking on one of our parts, it's not the transaction we agreed to, to engage in. Uh, and again, that's the same thing. You're getting someone's property without his consent, or you're getting a service from someone without his consent. Uh, in either case, um, you're, you're taking the fruits of someone's effort. You're taking part of his life via a ruse without consent. And you can say, well, he agreed, you know, when you, you give a trade, it's not like you're grunting, you know, that for that, and you're just pointing at things. That's not how trades work, right? You, you describe the items and there's a kind of assumption that everything is what it is purported to be. And that's the trade you're engaging in. And if that isn't the trade that's really happening, then you have the person's property against his will, non-consensually, and again, that's then force. Um, so the last kind of indirect use of force we wanted to talk about was extortion. And Gordon's asked us, what about extortion? So, uh, Ankar, any thoughts on that? So it's, a, it's again, a, a, I had put it in the category of it can look like a trade or a consensual transaction. Because if you think of the a, a kind of standard picture of extortion when the mob w would ask for protection money and it's we, they go into business or they go into a, a bar and say um, well if you don't give us some money um, who know you might suffer an accident or you better watch out for your family because you wouldn't want an accident to happen to and they're what they're suggesting is we're going to use force if you don't do this so it can look like it's a well, okay, the person consents and he agrees to it. But in the end, it's no different than your money or your life. I mean, you can think of that as a very primitive form of extortion. And the more sophisticated ones try to make it look like, no, he just agreed. He didn't want an accident to happen, so he just agreed to it. But the essence is it's the, you're going to be met with force. So you're not giving any, there's no exchange of value for value. I don't view it as a, at all as a positive that, um, oh, something might happen to my family. So it's the appearance of a civilized transaction when it, that's not what is occurring. And that's what extortion is, I think. The appearance that a value is being offered for a value, when in fact what's happening is uh, somebody's requesting a value at the threat of imposing themselves on you, at the threat of forcing you. Um, okay, so. Force is then uh, moral, thinks Rand, only in retaliation against the initiation of force. And uh, not only is it moral in the situation, it's morally mandatory in the situation, it's required. 
a we need to answer force with force, as opposed to a pacifist who um, would not answer force with force and just allow himself to be to be overrun or subject to force. Um, uh, are there any questions uh, about? I, I suspect probably there won't be, but why force is appropriate and necessary in retaliation? Take a moment on that. Okay, and uh, Augustina, do we know yet what? Um, oh, why? Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, we do have an question from Megan now, so why don't we proceed with that? Um, oh, we can put our, let's um, put Megan's, um, how do we make Megan able to talk? Okay. I think it's, she can she talk. She should be able to talk right now. Megan, okay. go ahead. Hear me? Yeah, you're a little quiet though. Oh, sorry. I don't have the best Bluetooth. There we go. There we go. Okay. So um, I noticed that Ayn Rand, you know, she's connecting fraud to force and extortion to force and, and all these related concepts and I was sort of wondering well, why doesn't she just say you know these are the actions that should be prohibited like list them instead of you know working so hard to connect all these ideas to force and I was wondering if it she's really trying to make the point that men live by their reasoning mind they have to and force is antithetical to that is that the correct way to think about it You're muted somehow, Greg. You're not showing as muted, but it looks like you're talking. Sorry, I switched my mic off. Oh. Okay, I'm unmuted now. I think that is right. She is making that point that men live by their mind, but uh, and force is what interferes with it. But there's a more proximate point. She's um, so the question is why doesn't she just have a list of here are a dozen things that are uh, need to be banned from society. But when you get a list of a dozen things, it's uh, how do you know when you need to add an extra one to it or remove an extra one or remove something from it? She's trying to integrate over the things that we need to ban from society to see what it is that they have in common, what it is about them all that makes them violations of a person's right, that makes them a threat to an individual's ability to live. Uh, and... Um, uh, so that we can understand in principle what's wrong with them and in principle what we need to do to ban them and also how we can then determine whether something else that might uh, we might dislike belongs on this list uh, or not. Uh, Ankar, any, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And if you think just of the history of law, a part of what happens is that there's laws against some fraud, and, it, and not say against if you're in a relationship and someone, your, your lover be, betrays your trust. It's not now you can launch a lawsuit and put him in jail. And there's a reason why in the law that kind of distinction is being made. They're grasping something and you're trying to identify what the principle involved is. And here part of what she's stressing, and what then we're stressing, is it's obtaining material values without consent, without the consent of, that's what fraud is about. And the, though there's values obviously involved in a personal relationship, it's not the obtaining of a material value without a person's consent. And it's, it's understanding that distinction. And this is why some are being prohibited by law and others aren't. And to get that fully explicit and clear, that's part of what she's doing, I think. So any follow-ups, Megan, or is that uh, helpful? Oh, it was incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. So we'll take, uh, good, Megan's muted now. Um, okay, so we want to move on to uh, the role of, uh, oh, uh, Adam says in the chat, the, the reason you need to retaliate with force uh, because being a, a pacifist is not practical for the very reason force is bad in the first place. I think that's right. Force interferes in your ability to live. Um, that's why it's bad in the first place. It's that it's interfering in your life. It's preventing you from living. And uh, you need to retaliate by preventing the forcer from 
doing what he's doing, namely forcing you. If you don't, you'll be prevented from living or your life will be sapped away from you drop by drop. And there's no way to prevent it other than by answering it in its own terms, or that's the, the argument. It incapacitates you and you need to incapacitate it. Um, Greg, is yeah. the only reason, um, because for not being a passive, pacifist is it is it the only reason just because it's not practical yeah but it's not practical because um i mean not practical feels like an understatement um i mean you could say the only reason for not jumping off a bridge is it's not practical and that's true but it's it's um you know i mean one way i think one way to think about it and if you think about the kind of argument that some pacifists make it's that well, no, what you should try to do is convince the force wielder, that is persuade the force wielder that there's something wrong with their, what they're doing. They shouldn't be doing this. Why are you treating me like this? But Ayn Rand's view, when it's intentional, when it's the intentional use of the initiation of force, that person is tossing aside reason. And it's my whim is going to rule and it's going to be my whim. I don't care what you think and what you judge is right or wrong how you want to act, my whim rules. And you're not going to be able to reach that person by persuasion. It's, it's, a, it's indeed, I think she thinks of it as, it's part of the sanction of the victim. You're acting and pretending as though they're open to reason when they're not. Their whole actions are declaring they don't care about reason. And you have to deal with such an uh, in, individual in a very different way. Um, and th this is most important. So this is obvious if someone's coming at you with a spear or something, right? They're running at you and charging at you. Where it's not obvious and really need thinking about is in the more subtle cases of extortion and things like this. So if you think in Atlas Shrugged, there's a scene where um, one of the characters is saying to another, um, is trying to convince him to do something. And he says, I'll give you anything that you want, you know, name, write your own ticket, name your price. And the character says, you have nothing to give me. And eventually he says, well, without me, you couldn't get out of this room alive, says the character who's trying to persuade him. And then he can give him anything, but anything extorted from him, he's right now a captive of his. And it takes a kind of active holding of the perspective when somebody's trying to deal with you, but part of the deal is that they're offering to remove force or threatening to impose it, that this isn't a deal, this isn't a, a trade. Uh, they're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to treat you as a human being to reason with and persuade, but in a context that's set by the fact that they're not treating you like a human being to reason or persuade, but as an object to be acted upon for their own ends, as though you're not in life as an end in yourself, as though you're not someone whose life is run by your own reason and who has to set your own purposes in pursuit of your own happiness by your own reasoning. And um, so that's the kind of situation where this uh, it's particularly important to bear this in mind. It's the kind of situation that pacifists uh, appease in, right? So you think about uh, the famous case of appeasement, appeasement of Neville Chamberlain uh, and Hitler, right? Acting as though they're making a deal with Hitler. Um, so why is it that we need government then as our instrument of retaliatory force? Why can't we retaliate uh, individually? Uh, Felipe asks in the question page, does the individual act, does an individual action need political sanctioning to be moral? And my answer to that is no for almost every individual action. Uh, you don't need political sanctioning to be moral. It just needs to be the right action for you to take for it to be moral. But there is one kind of action that I do think an individual can't take without the sanctioning of the others in his society in some way that you can't take unilaterally if you're in a social context. And that's the action of retaliating. That's the action of exercising retaliatory force outside of a immediate emergency kind of situation. And why is that? Why do we need a government for us to take retaliatory force rather than being able to do it individually, unilaterally? Greg, while we wait for um, comments, um, mm -hmm. Daniel was uh, in the Facebook group uh, talking about 
about the use of retaliatory force and um, he was grappling with the issue of what happens basically, I'm reframing his question, but essentially what happens in a case of an emergency where you cannot wait for the government to take action, for example, if your life is in, the, in immediate danger, is it okay for an individual to use retaliatory force against an aggressor? Yes. I think just precisely in that case, um, when there's no recourse to the government temporarily and until someone can get there. So you can't, you can, for example, subdue someone who's trying to attack you uh, or repel the immediate attack, but what you can't do is then go on to punish him. Got it, that sounds right. But why not? Why do we need government to be the agent of retaliation? Another way to put it is you can, you can defend yourself, but you can't retaliate. Uh, where retaliation is you know, kind of another discrete action after the particular episode of force is over, uh, that you go out and then go and exercise some more force to kind of get back at the person or to imprison them. We're getting some things in the chat here. Um, uh, Augustine, do you want to summarize? or I'm just seeing them scroll by pretty quickly. Yeah, Jeremy says retaliatory force needs to be placed under objective definition and application which a proper government should provide. Uh huh. Um, um, Alexandra says a government sets the objective standards for judging whether a particular action constitutes an initiation of force. And Mark says that the reason why we need government for, in this respect is there will be no clear standards of the criteria to be used to administer retaliatory action or justice if everyone took the adjudication of justice into his or her own hands. Yeah, and uh, we're here, we're getting a lot now. So I think these are, uh, give us the basic, uh, the basic answer. Ankar, is there anything you want to add to what we're hearing from our uh, uh, people online? No, I think that's good, um, what, they're, what they're bringing up. I mean, we, I'm sure you want to talk a little bit more about the whole issue. So I think you'll bring up the other elements of this. Well, so the, the, um, the, the kind of signal quote from Rand here is, a government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of force under objective control, i.e. under objectively defined laws. And I think that's really the essence. And this is what people are saying. And a lot of the questions that we're getting now, like, um, uh, Alex asks, uh, um, what is used to determine the appropriate amount of retaliatory force to use against somebody, right? Um, there, there's this question, there are a million other questions about how you do it, how much force is appropriate, how you can tell when force is appropriate in a given case, how you can know whether somebody really did violate a right, and so forth. And all of these questions are difficult. All of these questions require answers, and all of these questions are the type that reasonable people can disagree on. So we can't just have everybody independently exercising retaliatory force, answering these questions however they please, perhaps rationally, perhaps irrationally. Even if two people answer it rationally, they might disagree. Um, but we're going to have force being used all over the place. If this, if this happens, and this is not a safe situation. When one person exercises force against another, it's a real threat, and they're, in that sense, an initiation of force against everybody in the area around. And so even if I'm um, right that in, in my understanding that you initiated force against me, if I go about and try to use force against you in retaliation for it, um, everyone else around is every reason to be concerned about this. They're not sure if I'm doing it properly. They're not sure if force was really exercised against me in the first place. If it was, they're not sure that I'm doing it uh, um, uh, the, you know, in a proportionate way. My response, all of these questions need to be answered. And until they're answered, my exercising of retaliatory force is a threat to everybody in the environment. And in effect, I'm initiating force in my attempt to retaliate. 
uh, in order to, to not have this, we need to place the use of retaliatory force under objective control. And what objective means is that there are real standards of evidence here. The standard of evidence are uniform and known in advance. It's not just standards of evidence, but also standards of um, what punishments are for what crimes and how we determine all of that. And it's not just that all of this is known in advance, but it's that no one person in the society or little group of them is determining these things unilaterally and imposing them on the others. But because we're a society of people trying to live together, uh, there's some means to uh, subject this to the judgment of the people who are required to live under this regime. And uh, so it's not, again, some one group just um, deciding what the laws are and imposing them upon everybody else. And all of this is what we require a government to do, to bring objectivity to the protection of rights, to bring objectivity to the use of force. And objectivity involves all the elements that we've, uh, that we've been talking about. Um, Ankar, any more on that, on what objectivity means in this context? Well, just two things. One, we'll, we'll come back to this issue, I think, in a certain way when we talk about the next essay. I think the three... Um, crucial theoretical essays of Ayn Rand's on political philosophy are, is the uh, man's rights, which we talked about uh, in the first webinar, the nature of government and what is capitalism. And the issue of objectivity is featured in that, um, uh, in that essay. And I wanna come back to the way she talks about objectivity there and link it with the objectivity of government that she's stressing here in this essay. So it's a point that we're going to come back to, I think, in a deeper way when we get to that, uh, to, to, to next Tuesday, when we talk about what is capitalism. And I, I've always found, I don't think this, is, this metaphor is unique to Ayn Rand, but I think it's important for capturing what she thinks a proper government is. Um, so one of the descriptions she gives is, it should be an impersonable, impersonal robot with the laws as its only motive power. And that's, the, that's a direct quotation from the essay. And part of what impersonal robot means is to extract force from society, that it's not going to, you're gonna have a society that is about voluntary consent and persuasion and trade. You have to extract force, but that means it has to be clear to all the participants in that this, these actions are what constitutes the initiation of force and down to a very fine level of detail that if you engage in any actions like this, including things like extortion, fraud, negligence, this is what the initiation of force is. And this is when what retaliatory force looks like. And if the government goes too far, if for, for um, a small breach of contract, it executes you, that's not retaliatory force. That's now the government initiating force. All this has to be crystal clear as far as possible to everyone and that it's functioning not, as Greg was saying, by any individual's perspective on this, but it's written in law so that everyone knows this. And I mean, a government can't literally function as a robot, but insofar as possible, it's clear these are the principles governing why and everyone has the same view then of what counts as the initiation of force and what is actual retaliation versus um, too little or way too much use of force, which it then itself is the initiation of force. You're muted again, Greg. You learn, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but you learn says uh, the initiation of force was irrational but retaliatory force should be rational. And individual retaliation is prone to become whimsical and irrational. For it to be rational, there should be an objective standard and an institution enforcing such a standard. I think that's right. Uh, Felipe asked, what is it about the nature of government that responds to the menacing argument? I take it by the menacing argument. I've described it as menacing in the past. You mean this idea that an individual uh, seeking retaliation on his own uh, is in effect menacing or thre threatening all the other people around him. How is it that a government, what about the nature of a government uh, prevents that? Well, I think it's precisely this um, predictability and impersonality that Ankar talked about. 
There are known principles and procedures. It acts slowly, not quickly. There's a, a, a place to challenge if you think that it's wrong. The challenge is not um, going to one single individual who's aggrieved or mad at you, and that he has to determine whether uh, your challenge to his uh, attempt at retaliatory force is correct or not, but rather to an impartial group of people. There are procedures for choosing that group of people. There are procedures for settling and appealing and checking. Um, and uh, uh, not any government uh, has this feature, but any proper one does. And the better the government, the better it has this feature. It occurs to me that we haven't said what the definition of government is, and we probably should uh, at this point, right? A government is, um, uh, a government is, the, uh, I'll just quote her definition, an institution that holds the exclusive power to enforce certain rules of contact, conduct in a given geographical area. So a government has a territory, a geographical area, which is its jurisdiction, and it has the exclusive power to enforce rules of conduct there. Uh, it has a monopoly on the use of force. And um, so it, because it monopolizes the use of force, it gets rid of other force in that area that's not under its control. And uh, so you don't, if the government is functioning, you don't have to worry about force coming from other places. And the government uh, then uses that force under strictly defined rules, rules if it's a proper government that are derived from the principle of rights. Um, Ankar, do you want to talk about the, the role in defining rights as well as just enforcing them? Yeah, so we talked uh, last time in talking about the foundational principle of Ayn Rand's political philosophy, the principle of individual rights, that when she describes what a right is, she says a right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context. And we talked about, at, at some length last time, the importance of the defining that it, it, when you're establishing a proper political system and the principles of um, proper social organization, you have to clearly define um, the sphere of action in which an individual is free. Um, as Greg was stressing uh, on Tuesday, when you're in a society, there's all kinds of ways in which you interact with other individuals. And it has to be clear when we say your freedom of action, it's the freedom of action in which you're sovereign, in which your judgment decides, and you don't need the consent um, of other people. And that has to be very clear when it is you need consent of people and when it is you can act without their consent. And we've, we stressed that uh, last time that wealth and, and um, the, the creation of values and property grows and grows and grows. We talked a little bit this time about knowledge grows and grows. As civilization advances, there's all kinds of occasions where you have to think, okay, now that we, we've developed airplanes or automobiles or radio, just to give one kind of example of um, how does do rights actually apply here? What the development of radio, what kind of frequencies does it give you property in? And so um, is when someone's flying overhead and there's noise, is that an interference? Do you need the consent of the people who live on the ground in order to be able to fly a mile in, in the sky or what have you? There's all kind, and it has to be clearly defined. So it's understood and, and clearly defined. And the reasons have to be good reasons for why it's being defined this way such that you can say these are people's rights. But even take, uh, we were talking about some more kind of procedural rights. When DNA is discovered and there's DNA evidence, like what is the how, what kind of evidence is this? What, when, when we're thinking about proving a case, what role does it play? And you can, I mean, there's people who try to dismiss DNA evidence or people who you could argue that they put too much stock into it. And this has to be, again, defined in order to, to have a, proper legal system that is functioning by principles and not by just the, the private and, and because private arbitrary decisions of particular individuals. So there's a huge task for proper government. It's an ongoing task. It's not once writing down 
what the rights are and then just, okay, our work is done forever and uh, we, can, we can retire. I think this answers a question that uh, Parvuna asked in the chat. Uh, do the rights of individuals ever conflict such that the government would be morally right to use force to settle the dispute? Uh, or are individual rights uh, always in harmony? And there's a task of defining the individual rights so that they're always in harmony. Fundamentally, our rights are in harmony and uh, because our lives are distinct from one another. But when we're living so close to one another, uh, it can become ambiguous uh, who should have a say over who should be in charge of different spheres, where my life ends and your life begins. And uh, so it could seem like there are conflicts between our rights to life or our rights to liberty. And it's in just those situations that we need the principle of property, that we need the legislature to uh, clarify where these dividing lines are, so that uh, clarify them in, 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 as an application of the underlying principle of rights um, and define the kind of, put, put a sharper boundary around our, life, our rights, which are kind of vague in their boundaries because our lives are vague in their boundaries. Uh, in a situation where we're, we're so living close to each other. And then once the rights are defined properly, they don't conflict, and one standard involved in defining them properly is the standard that they can't conflict. So if you define them in such a way that they do conflict, you haven't defined them objectively. Um, if, if, if we go then to, we asked about some of the metaphors that are often given for the, I think it's thought of as, uh, as the, kind of government or state that classical liberalism was arguing for and some of the metaphors or a night watchman state or it's an umpire and Ayn Rand doesn't use these metaphors and I think it's it's for a definite reason that she doesn't use these metaphors none of these metaphors capture the full function and role that she thinks a proper government should play so you can think of the night watchman as he's like the policeman on the beat at night. And that's an aspect, that's the executive branch, you could say, that they're executing on the laws that are, and enforcing the laws that are on the books that actually exist. And that's an aspect of the role of government, but it's not the full role. And you don't understand really the why government is needed, if that's how you think about it, because it's too much like the rights and, and their implementation, which is a whole legal system, is here. How did it get here? Who knows? But all we have to do now is um, police it. And that policing is, is, a, is a derivative function of government in that sense. You first have to have the right laws, and then you have to police them. And it's a big task and an ongoing task of having the right laws. And that why the umpire is like the judiciary. That, so, and that's an important branch of government. But it's again, if you think of that's all government is, it's well, where do the laws come from? How do we know that they're correct? Um, are they actually being properly enforced? Um, or is there the government way too lax in the enforcement and then cases never come before the umpire? So, there, so the role of government is more complex and there's not one metaphor I think that captures um, what its actual role is. Yeah. There's a question by Felipe. He's asking, if government is necessary, what makes it a necessary good instead of a necessary evil like many authors like Hayek and even Patterson have proposed in the past? Yeah, I think um, that's directly to this point that, that Ankar is making, um, that there's all these positives to be accomplished by government. Right, the positives are the protection of rights, the defining uh, in the on the kind of periphery and the protection of them. But that's something that's really to be accomplished. It's not. Um, if you think about it this way, I mean, you can say that any good is a necessary evil. Food is a necessary evil. If only we didn't have to eat to live. It's such a drag that if we don't eat, we'll die. So eating is a necessary evil. And so is, is, is going to the doctor. And so is having housing and shelter is a necessary evil. If only things were good and we could just live out exposed to the elements. But in effect, what you're saying then is that any good is a necessary evil because you're on the premise that you should be able to uh, exist 
unobstructed without any effort, like, you know, someone in the Garden of Eden getting manna from heaven who lives automatically and is unaffected by anything automatically. But life isn't like that. that and, and anything like that wouldn't really be a life. Life is a process of, uh, that, of attaining the values you need to continue living. Life isn't something that exists unimpeded by, that exists without any needs uh, indefinitely. It's something you have to work to achieve. And if you want to live together with other people, the conditions in which you could live together with other people are something you need to work to achieve. And those, uh, those conditions aren't some automatic harmony that just comes about until somebody screws it up by initiating force. It's rather uh, a lot of work needs to go into understanding uh, what, in what way you have to live together, creating the institutions that make clear to everybody what things would constitute initiations of force against one another, defining the rights so that we understand what principles we're coexisting together under, and coming up with, uh, with um, a way to deal with the inevitable conflicts that we're going to have, because even if everybody is rational and nobody is a criminal, so there are no evils in that sense, uh, there's still going to be confusions, disagreements, need for arbitration, and uh, all of that is a predictable need, just like hunger is a predictable need, that we need to uh, create an institution to deal with. And the things that we need to create in order to deal with our needs for survival are goods. That's what it is for something to be good. Uh, so it's not a necessary evil, but it's a good. And the thinking of it as a necessary evil is imagining some condition in which the needs that it served would get uh, automatically and um, automatically and uh, effortlessly yeah. resolved without anyone doing anything. And that's the kind of formulation that you see that Rand, I think, would really object to. If, if men were angels, you don't need government. But angels is putting it in the category of the supernatural. If they automatically and effortlessly knew what was right and knew what the other person was thinking and why they did this, and, and then you wouldn't need government. And it might be true. I mean, you can't really talk about the supernatural of what the conditions were, but the conditions of actual human beings, even if they're rational, is you don't automatically know everything. It's you still have disagreements, disputes. You can both read a contract and have a different interpretation of it. Um, and you need, and this is stressed in the essay, that governments needed, even if you're dealing only with rational men, not people who engage in conscious evil. And that's part of the whole context, that it's a necessary good. Yeah. Um, Ankar, we had said we were going to talk a little bit about the, the um, history, or in view of the history of government. Uh, in, in light of time, do you want to do that briefly, or do you want to just um, jump to the issue of whether we really need it in the response to anarchism? Um, yeah, let's jump. We, we've touched on some aspects that are relevant, I think, to the history. Maybe we'll come back to that at the end, but I think we should make sure we talk about the issue of anarchism. So. Okay, good. So she talks here about the, the, she's talked about the need for government. She's talked about the proper role of government is protecting rights, and it's limited to that role. We'll talk later about the functions of government and, and how they all relate to that role. But she notes that um, presently, uh, government isn't limited to that role. Governments are doing a lot of other things. The principle of right that rights that's meant to uh, to rein government into its proper function has been basically ignored and evaded. As a result of that, there are tyrannies rising all over the world or have risen. She's written in 1962, the Nazis rose and were defeated, but there were other fascist governments about. And of course, importantly, communism has taken over uh, half of the world at this point, and there are other communist revolutions uh, uh, in, uh, in effect or you know, taking place at this time. Uh, so, so it's important to argue against that. Um, and against this kind of totalitarian government, right? But she's concerned that some people have uh, thoughtlessly responded to this, not in the thoughtful way, by reasserting the principle of rights and the need of a government to function within this principle, but rather by embracing anarchism, which she regards as a, um, as a, ridiculous, uh, as a ridiculous and thoughtless and patently irrational position. And she gives two basic responses to anarchism 
uh, in general, which are just recapitulations of the reasons she said government is needed. One, government is needed for defense against criminals, and so an anarchist situation would lead one with no defense against criminals. Uh, and two, government is needed as an arbiter for the honest disagreement people might have against uh, with one another. And so without a government, there'd be no final arbiter. They'd be left having to fight, fend for themselves. Maybe they could find an arbiter that they'd, dis that they'd agree to settle the dispute. But then if one of them disagreed with the arbiter, it would escalate and there'd be no final court of appeals except somebody just uh, retaliating uh, on his own. But the, the allegedly more sophisticated form in which the idea of anarchism exists and uh, which Alex is now asking about is the idea of competing governments or what's sometimes called market anarchism or anarcho-capitalism. This is a movement that's associated especially with uh, uh, Murray Rothbard, who was uh, briefly an associate of Rand's or someone who knew her anyway. And um, all the people at the von Mises Institute now are, are of this school of thought, even though Ludwig von Mises was opposed to it, or opposed to anarchism anyway. And it, it really a, has always been a major and probably dominant strand of thinking in the libertarian movement. Uh, most of the people organizing Student for Liberty events these days uh, are subscribers to this in one form or another, most of the ones I've met. So what's her view on uh, the idea of competing governments or anarcho-capitalism? Uh, why does Rand see this as uh, uh, a patently uh, unworkable and ridiculous and floating and naive idea. Uh, Ankar, do you want to uh, uh, address that or start to address that? Yeah, we can, I can touch back on a point that came up about the issue of power. And, and we talked about a distinction that she makes, not in this essay, but in many of her writings about capitalism and government uh, and the nature of freedom that you have to be able to have a clear distinction between economic power and political power and realize that they're very different. And as we talked about that her view of economic power, it's the offering of a positive, it's the issue of trade or of, of the creation of wealth and then of trading with people. It requires consent and you do it because you think you're gaining a positive. You, you go in and buy uh, groceries at the Safeway because it's valuable to you and more valuable than the money that you're paying for them. It, it, so it's, and it's, they're offering you a positive, which you can take or leave. Political power is the visiting of a negative on you that you're unable to resist if it's successful. The whole point is to bypass your will, your judgment, and whether you consent or not is irrelevant. And a competition then, when we're talking about competition in the context of economic power, it's people are offering, like Microsoft is offering you software, Apple's offering you software, Google's offering you software, and you have to decide which is, in given your context and life and goals, so which is the best offer? Maybe it's none, but it's, oh, I'm going to buy the iOS and the, the, I'm going to be in the Apple's ecosystem, or I'm going to be in Google's, or I'm going to be in Microsoft's, or I'm going to do a little bit of both. But it's all the gaining of the value. And what they're offering is a value. You're free to walk away. And you, you, there's no loss to you if you say, no, this is a deal I don't accept. I'm going to walk away. So it's a competition of, to offer more and more value to you. But the competition in force is not anything like that. A comp it's, it's who's going to be, uh, be able to institute their random whim and will over everybody else. And her view is when you, uh, there is such a thing as a competition in force, but one of the ways she puts it is when there's a competition of uh, force, it's something like she said, a murderer wins over a pickpocket. It's the person who's most ruthless in the use of force that is, he's trying to gain control. And that is not, that is a descent into worse and worse conditions, whereas economic condition is arising to value and new values and new creations. It's an ascent and the other is a descent. So they're very different. And a competition in the use of force, it's not like there is such a thing and what would it be like? We know what it is. A competition in the use of force is a war or a cold war, right? Force competing with each other is people fighting or people sizing each other up for a fight. 
Um, so, I mean, and this comes up, a lot, this is really, in essence, the answer to a lot of the questions there are about competing governments. So Alex asks, how would a set of competing governments in one geographical area lead to anarchy? It wouldn't lead to anarchy, it is anarchy. Anarchy is the state where there isn't a government, and a government is something that monopolizes on the use of force. But what's wrong with anarchy? What's wrong with anarchy is it's a situation of rule by might, rule by pure might, as opposed to might being subordinated to right. So it's a situation where the governments are either fighting with each other actively, as would almost certainly happen, or if they're not fighting with one another actively, they're in a kind of state of, of sizing each other up on who could use more force, what's our, the threat, uh, you know, and engaging each other in a kind of real politic against each other, as opposed to having a society that's governed by principle. And uh, again, um, um, you'll learn, or you'll learn, again, I, I don't know how to say this, uh, says, what about the idea that we have competing governments internationally? Well, we do have competing governments internationally, but we don't have a, um, uh, well, there are two points. I mean, one is, um, I, I think there ought to be multiple governments around the world, but we should keep in mind that our, our, the competing governments we have internationally, if you want to put it that way, don't uh, get along very well, right? They are in a kind of state of power dynamics with one another. And this point comes up because people say, well, if you imagine that each person is his own little government, then we in effect have a state of competing governments, even in anarchy. And you could imagine all kinds of ways in which the governments would relate to one another uh, um, uh, through treaty organizations and through creating treaties and peace treaties and making terms with one another. And that was a point that um, David Friedman, the son of Milton Friedman, the famous economist and a, a advocate of this anarcho-capitalist idea made to Harry Binswanger once. And, and uh, Harry, who was a friend of Ayn Rand's and a, a philosopher in his own right, uh, brought this point to Ayn Rand's attention and said, well, what do you think about this idea that the competing governments wouldn't just go to war, they'd have treaties and make terms with one another and so forth? And her answer without skipping a beat was, you mean like the UN? And that's significant because what is the UN in Rand's view? And I think in fact, it's an organization through which different governments with incredibly different moral statuses uh, interact with each other on the premise that there, uh, that there is no, that there's moral equivalence between them, that in effect morality doesn't matter in, uh, in these kinds of affairs. And so it's a kind of real politic where they just compromise and make terms with one another. And the result of it is that the good compromises with and is defeated by evil. And the main effect of the UN in the period in which Ayn Rand was living was the surrender of half of the world into communist dictatorship. And it's not had very good effect since then. Um, now, if you ask, why is it okay to have multiple governments in different countries, uh, you know, even in an ideal situation where they're all good governments, uh, but not multiple governments in the same country, and it's uh, what Jesse says online, that governments each have a jurisdiction. And it's possible if you're in a different space to, you know, it's, for people living in all the way in China and me, uh, I don't interact directly with the people living in China. And so I can't accidentally um, trample on their rights or kill them uh, or trespass on their property. It, the, my interaction with them is fairly limited. And so there's not a need, we're not in effect in society with one another. And because of that, there's not a need for a single institution to um, arbitrate disputes between us and get involved in case I uh, trample on their rights or them on mine. But when people are living together in the same place, there is a need to know who's the final court of appeal uh, to govern the use of force uh, within that territory. Force can only be used locally, in effect. And so it's locally that you need a government, not globally. Ankar, any further thoughts on why, um, you know, it, we don't need a world government in effect? Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll say something on that and then uh, another aspect of that, and then I wanna come back to some of the other, you, you were looking at the issue of war in the UN and that's on the sort of grand scale, which I think is really important to get that. And, but she makes the same point on a smaller scale uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that, but it's, I think there is also, so I think it, it's for sure the issue of a government is to govern in a certain area 
and and the local the local aspect of it as well. But I think of it as well as you wouldn't want one world government because there is an issue of checks and balances from the perspective of it's if one government because governments do go bad that there's the the issue of well you can look well but other countries and other regions geographic they're functioning better and both people can move there but you have that kind of comparison um so just as there's uh um local state federal government and part of the issue there is they're serving as checks on one another it, so it's a part what she talks in in the essay about they, the founding fathers devised a whole system of checks and balances. And I think there's a lot that goes into what the checks and balances are. It's part of dividing clearly the functions of government into branches of, of an executive, a legislature, a judiciary, but it's also the federal system of, of diffusing power to different governments for different, they have jurisdiction over different things. And, so, and then when you're thinking of the whole world, that it's not just one monolithic government, that if it goes bad, everything goes bad. And in, in the better eras, it's people learn from the example of Britain or the example of the US versus other countries and say, yeah, that is the way to politically organize and we should be able to emulate that. Um, and I think that's, that's an aspect as well of why, and she, she was for sure opposed to one world government. Um, you gave the example of the UN and of, of war as this is what it looks like when there's not um, a monopoly on the use. And this is what the competition in force looks like. And the smaller scale, the examples that she gave were things like the mafia in, in just a city, you could think. And it's again, yeah, they make deals and agreements. And then, yeah, this, that's your territory. You can beat up whoever you want in that territory, but don't come into ours and say who's can... Uh, who's a victim and who's not, and, so, and will then respect you. And, but it, that's what a competition at a lesser scale looks like. Um, and she, in, in this essay again, she talks of it often as gang uh, rule or gang warfare, and that exists at a global scale. She, I mean, she thinks of Soviet Russia as just a large gang, it's institutional gang rule, and it exists at a city level. And there's plenty of areas in the world and including, I think, at times in the US where there in effect isn't a government functioning. It doesn't, it's not wielding a monopoly of force. And what you have is various gangs in the city and you either have to somehow align with them or the better individual who thinks all of these gangs, they all have really bad elements. He ends up being a victim of most of them. Um, Cause he, he so, and, and it, so it's a real push that you have to join a gang it's, and that's why she thinks anarchy is a bunch of individuals just sort of walking around and interacting with each other as individuals. That's not what happens. You have to join a gang for protection. Yeah, it's, it, it's important. She says in another essay about the anarcho-capitalists that they're so detached from reality that they don't see the literal examples of their theory and practice. And it's her view, and I think she's right, that this is not something that hasn't been tried. It's tried all the damn time. The New York mafia families, the Crips and the Bloods, every place where you have gang warfare, uh, in prisons where there are gangs fighting against each other, this is not a reductio ad absurdum of uh, anarcho-capitalism. This is literally the meaning of anarcho-capitalism. There's no other way it could work. Is saying that this is not actual anarcho-capitalism is the same, in her view, as saying, well, the USSR is an actual communism or China isn't actual communism because we have a different view of what this would look like if implemented. This is the actual literal, literal implementation. And if your theory says it would work differently, it's because your theory is out of touch with reality. Um, and I have to say, there's been a whole lot of essays from anarcho-capitalists starting with an open letter to Rand by Ray Child uh, saying, you know, well, she hasn't considered this view. Uh, there's a whole lot of complicated ways you can elaborate about it. In my view, these objections have never once been answered. There's no answer to these objections. There hasn't been a plausible one written. There's been no real serious attempt to answer them. And it's not that Rand hasn't considered this and objectivists haven't considered it. There's not an answer to them. None has been given, and I don't think any can be given. Anarcho-capitalism is just anarchism, and anarchism is gang rule. 
And if you want to see it as what the the kind of political scale is, I put up in other presentations a kind of line, and you know, libertarians think or people who are sympathetic to anarcho-capitalism think on one end of the line is anarchy and on the other end of the line is totalitarianism. And there's the question of where you fall along it and the consistent extreme would be anarcho-capitalism. Maybe objectivism is really close to it because it thinks government should do very little. Uh, that is not the right way to think about it, at least not from Rand's perspective. The line runs from on the one hand, totalitarianism, to on the other hand, oh, sorry, the line runs from uh, on the one hand, objective governance, to the other hand, gang warfare. And gang warfare takes various forms. One form is communist totalitarianism, another form is fascist totalitarianism, and another form is uh, anarchic gangs. But it's just gangs fighting one another for power. And they're more or less institutionalized, but it's the rule of dumb force, force not under the, um, under the uh, under moral principle. It's the rejection of the, the principle uh, that um, Rand thinks is the one principle you need to accept to live in society, which is the principle of the separation of force and whim. Uh, and I should say in this connection, this is another reason why I reject, and I think Rand would have rejected, the term minarchism, which is used by people who think uh, the objectivist view and the view of others like objectivists and anarchism are very much alike. There's, you know, anarchism, no government, and minarchism, a little government. But that whole way of thinking about it is wrong. It's not the government should be as little as possible or it's a, on a continuum of how much government you have. There's, are we protecting rights? Are we organizing our society so that it's object, uh, governed objectively in accordance with moral principle, the principle of individual rights, or are we not? And, and from that, uh, our position is that government should be minimal. It's that it should do the right things. Or Rand's position, but hours since we agree with it. Um, Ankar, do you want to say a word or two since we're talking about libertarianish views about what Steve asked Rand's relation to Nozick's view of procedural rights before we close on the role of the government? Um, yeah, so if I remember the, the question as it was posed, it was something like, is, is part of Rand's view that one's procedural rights would be violated um, without a proper government. Is that, is that, uh, Agustin, is that a, a good, uh, I mean, a basic summary of what the question was? Um, I can read you the question and summarize it. Um, he wants, uh, Steve wants to know what you think of Nozick's conception of uh, procedural rights. Because Nozick has an argument whereby you have not only the basic negative rights that you have, but also the right to have your rights adjudicated in an epistemically reliable manner. And the ultra-minimal state is therefore justified in imposing its oversight on agencies that employ non-objective procedures. Yeah, I, I think the, the way Rand is thinking of it, I don't think she thinks of it as two sets of rights. You have the rights to right, uh, to, to life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, and then you have a bunch of procedural rights as well. It's, she thinks you have, these, these are, again, we stressed last time, these are principles of, that we're trying to implement, and the implementation of the right to life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. This has to be carefully defined outlined, codified, written into law. And part of that aspect of really securing and defining these rights is this is how um, government is going to function in the protecting, upholding of these rights, in the execution of the laws, in conducting trials. Um, but the Nozick's view is that these all exist sort of I mean, the way uh, he's he operating in a kind of state of nature perspective. They all exist pre, almost pre-civilization um, as individual, you, you could just understand and define all these rights. But Rand's perspective is they're defined in implementing a proper government. So there are procedural rights, like right to due process, right to a fair trial. And there can be as, as concrete as a right to a trial by jury in certain kinds of cases. But these are all aspects of the whole implementation of the rights to life, liberty, property, 
and the pursuit of happiness. They're not two sets of rights, I think, is, is the way that Rand is thinking about it. But part of what the government does then is establish objective procedures by which your rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness will actually be defined, protected, secure. Um, let's uh, then move on with uh, what time we have left to just say a little bit about uh, Rand's view of what the proper role of government is. I'll, I'll quote her. Uh, Since the protection of individual rights is the only proper purpose of a government, it is the only proper subject of litigation. All laws must be based on individual rights and aimed at their protection. All laws must be objective and objectively justifiable. Men must know clearly and in advance of taking an action what the law forbids them to do and why, what constitutes a crime, and what penalty they will incur if they commit it. And so, uh, breaking out of the quote now, this means that the, uh, the government's functions are police, military, and courts. Um, and I think also that she doesn't mention it here, uh, uh, well, the executive encompasses the police and the military, and the legislature to do the kind of defining of, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, all the kind of spelling out of the particular laws so that they can be promulgated and known in advance, including what the penalties will be and so forth. Um, a, a number of people asked, Steve and Al both asked about the relation between criminal and civil law and whether Rand would want to, uh, to collapse that. Uh, I think she wouldn't for the reason we've been talking about uh, um, uh, before. Uh, the b- breach of contract where it's unintentional, I think, is a, is a civil matter. Um, there are different kind of standards in criminal law. In criminal law, you are punishing somebody because the person um, uh, intentionally or or through gross negligence um, uh, uh, violated, initiated force against somebody. But there are wholly accidental initiations of force that don't require punishment, but do require some kind of restitution to make the victim whole. And uh, it's, it's these things that are covered by civil but not criminal law. There are some cases where the two overlap. Ankar, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, one way to think about it is because she brings up the issue of motivation. And I think in criminal law, the perspective is you have an individual or a group of individuals who are saying, to hell with the law. Um, we're our own law. And in civil cases, it's not the person, the, you're treating them as, He's trying to be law-abiding, but he's actually done something that interferes with other people's rights. And it's a very different, your perspective on those two individuals as a, as thinking of it as a society and we're organizing, we've got one who are saying to hell with your social organization, we are going to decide. And then the other is it's a law-abiding person. And and I think you treat the part of the issue of punishment is, this, that you have a very different view of those two cases. I mean, I don't think it has to be somebody who's trying to be law-abiding to be tried in the civil law. It, it's just that uh, the flouting of the law is required for it to be a criminal case yeah. and isn't required for it to be a civil case. So you could have someone who flouts, like O.J. Simpson was, uh, uh, after being acquitted for murder, was uh, convicted of wrongful death. Um, and it's because the standards of evidence are different there, and, and there are reasons why the standards of evidence are different and, and ought to be different. It requires, well, this is, we can have follow-up questions on Facebook about that if we want. Uh, I'll just mention, um, well, I don't want to talk more about it. Uh, I think, you know, in current law, we have family law courts, and I think it's appropriate that we have those to deal with issues of custody and uh, if there's a, a worry that a um, parents are abusing a child or something, taking them away. There are special courts for that, and I think that there ought to be, and this is related to some of what we were talking about, about children's rights uh, in the, uh, on, on Facebook afterwards. Um, so we've talked about the proper role of government. Um, it's necessary to say a word about what is improper, what government shouldn't do, what necessarily um, uh, invades rights if it does it. And, uh, well, one, interfering in the realm of ideas, which we'll talk about in our, in our last uh, session a couple of weeks from now. But the one that I think is more obvious and more probably stressed here is uh, interfering in uh, private transactions in the economy. 
So a proper government will have no welfare state, certainly. It, uh, it will have no economic policy at all. So it won't be trying to uh, help business or help labor or make GDP go up or down. It's just not part of what government should have any involvement with because that's not a matter of protecting people's rights. And it will have no services that it offers other than the service of protecting rights. So it won't do things like run a post office, administer, run roads and build roads um, or anything else of, of, that, uh, of that sort. Uh, any other comments on Ankar on this issue of the, the scope of government function? I, ju I think just one of the ways she conceptualizes it, I think is, is helpful for the way she's thinking about it. So it's um, what Greg's talking about is that for Rand, there's a separation of government and the economy. And in other of her essays, she'll put that explicitly that what I'm arguing for, for the same essential reasons is in the way at the founding of America, there was a separation of church and state or church and government. Um, there should be, but there wasn't. And this is part of what she thinks is um, non-ideal about the US constitution. There should be the same kind of separation of the economy and of the economic lives of citizens, not just their religious lives, but their economic lives and the government. Um, and so she, she thought of this, that there's a principle, it's not just the laundry list, and it's not, this is what you weren't suggesting, Greg, but it's people think of it, like you get the, what about roads? What about schools? What about electricity? What, and there's a way to think about it in a principled form, and that it is, there's a separation of government and economy, just as there was a principle separation of church and state. So I think we have time to take maybe one voice question uh, Gordon's uh, had one he's been raising with us. Should we, uh, should we bring him on the line? Gordon, if you're there, please uh, raise your hand so I can know that you're there and allow you to speak. There he is. Okay. He's still muted, it looks like, though. I'll unmute him. Oh, there we go. No? Unmute. There it is. Gordon, Gordon. you want to ask us what you wanted? Uh, I, I just put my questions down there on the, on the chat page. Um, uh, when it comes to these issues of um, preemptive action, uh, when does it constitute an initiation of force and when is it protective? So could you give us some examples of an example of preemption uh, that, um, that you're concerned about? I mean, you yeah, did writing. I, but. I gave an example there of that if I have a next door neighbor who keeps a yard that's, that's full of tanks and artillery pieces, and he gets deliveries of ammunition a couple times a week, and the guns on the tanks and the art, artillery are pointed at my house, um, do I have the right to preemptively do something about that show of force? All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Gordon. So let's, um, Ankar, do you want to start on that one? Uh, sure. I think there's uh, a few things at play here. So one is I don't, uh, I don't have a view that people should be able to own tanks um, and, and military uh, style equipment that is appropriate when a military is using force. Part of what it means for a government to have a monopoly on the use of force is includes that they're not people roaming around who are going to overthrow the government. And the reasons why you would have tanks or something like that can only be to use against the government. Um, so, and that, uh, and that is a threat. And I think it's a threat to all the citizens that we've got someone who wants to have a revolution against the government. And when you're at the stage of really having a revolution, you are at war with your government and the government views you as a threat. They might not be successful to be able to end that threat. And it might be when it's, when you think say of the founding fathers in a revolution, you might even be sometimes on the side of the revolutionaries, but the nevertheless, the, the, they're, they're at a state of war. Um, 
And it doesn't have to be when the bullets start flying that you're at a state of war. It can be well before that, when it's clear that they're preparing for a war against you. And that, I think, is, is an objective threat. Um, and there, there are similar kinds of cases when, it's, when we're not talking about military style, but the whole of having um, uh, kind of people arming as preparation against the government is a massive threat. And if you think of the government, again, as it's something good when you have anywhere a halfway decent government that's been established. It's a dangerous thing that there's people who want to overthrow that and take power for themselves. Yeah, so let's take it out of the military uh, context for a moment and uh, imagine even a situation where there's not yet a government, right? So we'll talk about how it should be with a government, but imagine for whatever reason, uh, you're two civilized people, but uh, are, you're out in the wilderness somewhere on an expedition and you encounter another guy and he comes up in front of you with a bunch of nunchucks and is swinging them and engaged in all these kind of karate moves, uh, you know, a few feet away from you. That guy is threatening you. That's not somebody who's peacefully engaged in an expedition. It's perfectly reasonable of you to think that this guy is trying to intimidate me. He's trying to uh, uh, threaten me. And if you think he's doing that, you think he has initiated force on you. Right? It's not just that he's going to. He's, in effect, announced his intention to harm you and tried to scare you into being under his will. And at that point, you're under force when you're under threat of force. Uh, and you're entitled to respond forcibly to him. Indeed, you should. Right? Or run away if you can get away. But you're, you're in a situation of force with him there. And then there are going to be some cases where it's ambiguous. And he might not have intended to initiate force against you, but he was uh, intimidating you and so forth. Um, and in those cases, it's hard to tell uh, what to do, which is one of the reasons why um, it's bad for people to be in a situation where they have to act as their own uh, judge, jury, and executioner, so to speak. So in a, a proper society with a government, there would be laws, laws on the books about what things constitute um, threats and menaces to other people. Uh, for example, if somebody's brandishing a gun, in most situations, that would be um, a threat, but there might be some in which it's not, say they're at a firing range. And there are laws on the books about how you're allowed to carry guns and what you're allowed to do with them. And there are a range of, I think, acceptable, appropriate laws about whether carry should be open or concealed and so forth. That, um, But there need to be laws on the books about this so that people can know before they do something whether that thing will be interpreted reasonably as a threat by their neighbors, and their neighbors will know how to interpret what they do, and there are laws about this. And that's, you know, even on a scale much lower than military-grade weapons. And it's, it's all the more so the case when there are military weapons. And, and Bobby uh, on the, the chat mentions that he has some friends, uh, or Gordon, rather, uh, mentions that he has some friends who own and use tanks, and they use them in parades and so forth. And, and that might well be fine, but we need a way to delimit these cases from one another so that everybody knows this is a decommissioned tank or, or he has a license to use it or he, he's using it for this reason and not that reason. And again, there are different ways that the law could stand on that and it can be different in different municipalities and different ranks, but so that it's understood when somebody's moving about with a weapon of tremendous massive force, everyone knows what they're doing with it, why they're doing it, and uh, that they're not, therefore, intimidating people by it. And again, there are different ways that we can uh, sort that out. But what we need is a framework in which people can make their intent clear to one another when they're, and when they're doing things that other people around them would have reasonable concerns are um, indications that they're about to initiate force against them. There are ways for the intent to be made clear, for everybody to check on this and know about it. And then in that context, it's unreasonable to retaliate against them and the government shouldn't retaliate against them. Um, so that's at least my, my thought on that. Uh, there are a lot of other good questions, but we're at time now or over it a little bit. So I'll post another uh, comment like I did last time asking for follow-up questions and we'll discuss them on Facebook over the course of the week. And uh, maybe some of them we'll discuss in, in one of the sessions next week. And uh, we'll also, I think tomorrow, we're gonna post the questions for the next two sessions, which are all gonna be on, um, uh, on the essay, What is Capitalism? Any last thoughts, Ankar?
No, just to thank everyone again for attending. We've got, again, good questions and comments. So thank you for that. And we look forward to talking to you again next Tuesday, uh, same time. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.